It's really uh, a pleasure to be here and see such a good crowd. Uh, they actually moved it out of one room into this room because they needed more, they knew they were going to need more space. And I think what it says is that there are a lot of people who are interested in this issue. And that it's a pleasure to be the honorary chair of this chapter since its inception in 20, uh, 2005. And uh, I've yet generally been here except when congressional business kept me away from it. Uh, I'm pleased to be here because there are so many able and uh, in activated activists uh, here tonight. Um, I'm especially pleased to be here with Quentin Young. Uh, Dr. Young, who you'll hear in a minute, <laughs> both came from Chicago, uh, University of Illinois, and uh, Cook County and all the rest. Uh, he's a little older than I am, but he's been fighting for it even before I got to medical school, and I wanna, I'm very pleased uh, to have him as an ally during the 93-94 efforts with Mrs. Clinton, and he didn't quit. You got to, one thing you learn about this business is if you quit, they win. And Clinton's uh, tenacity, I think, is uh, the greatest testament to what has to happen as we try and change this system in this country. Now, I've introduced, as you heard, the inter my H.R. Uh, 1200 since I got to Congress. It's basically a single-payer system, state by state, uh, with national standards and national financing, but let states develop their own mechanism. The reason for that's very simple. I was in medical school when uh, the most famous Canadian in all history uh, was prime minister of one province, Saskatchewan. His name was Tommy Douglas. And Tommy Douglas started with one province and spread it across Canada and made it ultimately happen uh, in the whole country. And it, it is a model that I still think is the way it's going to happen in this country. I do not think it's going to happen from Washington, D.C. I wish it did, but uh, I've been there long enough and I've listened to enough people to realize that what's going to happen is it's going to happen state by state. Now, <clears throat> I particularly was disappointed when the president uh, came into office and immediately took single payer off the table. When you saw that, you realized that it wasn't going to happen nationally. And I think that uh, whatever his reasons were, he'll have to explain to you, but I think he was wrong. I think it should have been kept there, a public option should have been kept there. And our, your own Dr. Flowers, Margaret Flowers, raised hell in the Senate Finance Committee about its refusal to hear witnesses, a single witness, about single payer. They wouldn't even listen to it. And in my view, that tells you the resistance at the national level, so we're going to do it at the state level, one state at a time. Now, we also decided, however, that we had to work with the president to get as much done at the national level as we could. Uh, my colleagues on the Ways and Means Committee and in the Progressive Caucus, uh, it was hard. It's hard to give up your ideal and be very pragmatic, but that's what we did. We said we're going to get everything done we can uh, with this mechanism that we've got in front of us. And um, they say politics is the art of the possible. And uh, the Affordable Care Act is clearly that. It is not a perfect piece of legislation by any stretch of the imagination. But in spite of the shortcomings, uh, perhaps the greatest step forward uh, was made in 100 years of our trying. We got to the beaches. It was D-Day. We got on the beaches. Now, we didn't have very much of the country yet. Uh, and we've been fighting to stay on the beaches ever since, as you can see from uh, these last session, this last session of the Congress. Uh, the attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act come day after day after day, and we've had lawsuits all over the country. And about March 16th or 17th, set some time aside to watch and listen for the proceedings in the Supreme Court. The case is going to be argued. And it is my belief that um, <clears throat> it's very hard to think that ultimately they are not going to affirm 
the right of the Congress to control one-sixth of the economy of this country. If they say that, that we have no control over it and it can run wild, the free enterprise system uh, can go without it, uh, I think we are in serious trouble because the economics will force a change in what's happening in private insurance, either by replacing it with a single-payer plan or by tightly regulating private insurance companies. Some countries have gotten to universal coverage by a sort of a utility method, the same thing we do with our utility prices through our utility commissions. You can do it that way or you can do it through a single-payer system. If you watch, if you read the newspapers, occasionally you find some truth in them. Uh, it's not every day, but every once in a while. Uh, but there's a recent uh, article by Ezek Emanuel, uh, who is uh, in the New York Times a few weeks ago predicting, he's a physician, uh, was in the White House, in, the, in the, uh, the Obama White House, and he predicted that private insurers will be extinct, extinct, by 2020. Now, I don't know if insurance companies are going to be like the dodo bird or not, or the carrier pigeon, but the fact is that that's Zeke's point. Now, <clears throat> there are others who think that, um, uh, well, Aetna's CEO, Mark Bertolini, embraced this prediction in a speech last week and admitted that insurance companies would have to change radically to merely survive in the post-healthcare reform era. They know it in the industry. They can see us coming. And don't ever lose sight of the fact that they recognize we're out there and coming for them because they recognize it. And this is one of the most lucrative providers of health insurance in the country. And he's willing to say something like that in public. So what's next? Well, with the current political climate in DC, it's clear to me that single payer advocates should focus on the state level. I think you ought to be working as they are in Vermont and as they have in California. I recently had a long talk with uh, Governor Schweitzer of Montana, and he said, Jim, can you believe it? If I had all the federal money coming into the state of Montana, I could do the same thing they're doing in Saskatchewan, right north of me. I could cover everyone if they just give me control of all the federal money that comes into the state of Montana. So there are people out there who are thinking this, and um, I expect that uh, the states shouldn't expect the Congress to be very helpful very quickly, but I'm working on a bill to make it possible for the federal government to give waivers to states to do their own single-payer system. The idea behind the bill is to funnel the dollars from all the federal health care programs directly into a, a participating state, remove the legal barriers, ERISA and others, uh, that block a state from operating a single-payer system, and impose outcome goals to ensure that the state achieves the necessary benchmarks, both in coverage and in quality. Now, some of you remember, or there's probably a few gray hairs in here, who remember um, that we started the basic health plan back in 1984 in this state. Governor, I wrote the bill and Governor Gardner signed it and we put it in place at Country Doctor uh, in 1984. But the reason it is not a single payer system in this country or in this state is that ERISA prevents the state from getting large employers into the system. So the bill that we're putting together will give this pathway, a legal pathway, uh, so that places like Vermont uh, and others will probably be, a will be able then to launch a single-payer system. Now, they can do some things, they can be more unified, but without some changes in federal law, they are going to have a very difficult time. And <clears throat> in my view, the Canadian experience is really worth remembering. Their system started in 1947, and in one province, as I said, in Saskatchewan, and it wasn't ratified until 1967. 20 years later, it took to progress across Canada. Started with Saskatchewan and uh, British Columbia, and then there were several others, and finally the guys in Ottawa said, you know, something going on here. 
The model for that is you're seeing it right before your very eyes, played out right now, and that's this whole question of same-sex marriage. Uh, it's taking a similar course. Uh, just last year, Maryland, New York, and now, of course, or this year, and the state of Washington have done it at the state level. The full sense of equality will not come until probably there's 10 or 15 states, and then the Congress will figure out, you know something? I think I, I hear something out there. Maybe we better do something about it. And the dominoes will start to fall. Now, health reform is complex, and regardless of your differences in philosophy, and we all have our own view of what's right in the world, uh, <clears throat> but we really need to work together. Uh, we have to work on all fronts, in my view, uh, and I think that this state has, has had a very vibrant uh, walk-in and other things have worked very well in keeping people aware of the benefits of a single-payer system, and I think that we need to do that as we implement. I believe that the next session of Congress, 2013, when we implement the Affordable Care Act will be one of the most important sessions of Congress in probably 50 years, 60 years. Since 1935, there will be nothing that compares with what happens when we put together the Affordable Care Act and push it out there. Secretary Sebelius is already designing a system because there's a lot of states that are saying, well, we're going to wait and see what the courts are going to do. We're not doing anything. So there are lots of states that are not preparing. This state is working at it. But Sibelius is ready to take a federal system into those states that have sat and done nothing. So it is, it's going to happen in 2013, and I've, I'm excited to be there in the Congress. We need people like you out in the streets talking about it, going to clubs, going all over the place, speaking everywhere. Um, I, I really think that this is a crucial time for the, the democracy in this country. Healthcare is the one last thing that we have not provided in this democracy. We got Social Security, we got unemployment insurance, we got lots of things for foster kids, and we've gotten welfare and all these kinds of things, but healthcare remains the single most disturbing issue. I fly uh, every week to Washington 35 times a year. Um, I started flying in 1988, 24 years ago. And the flight attendants who were flying with me then were uh, 30 years old, and now they're 54. And more than half of those women flying as flight attendants are flying because their husband has a job without health care benefits, and they have to hang on to that job. Not because of the pension, because they lost the pension in the bankruptcies. They haven't had a salary increase in six years, but they got their health care benefits. And now recently, as they brought United and Continental together, they said to them, okay, girls, we got a deal for you. We'll give you $2,500 for every year you work for the company, take your money and go. And all these people said, what about health care? And they said, oh. so they're not leaving. They're not taking it because they can't face the economic insecurity that comes with not having health insurance. So this is an issue, it's going to be dealt with, and it's going to be done by people like you putting pressure on the outside and some of us on the inside doing our part. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce or reintroduce uh, Quentin Young. Uh, m most of you in the audience know of Quentin from, as an icon and hero for the social justice and health justice uh, effort in this country for the last 60 years. <laughs> in, in the 60s, he was a co-founder of the Medical Committee for Human Rights, which uh, sent and facilitated many doctors to go down south and stand beside our brave uh, civil rights workers and uh, help care for them and uh, pe people who were underserved in that area. In, 
In the 1970s, Medical Committee for Human Rights also did the same thing alongside the people fighting the war against, uh, the, against the war in Vietnam across the country. And uh, that was Medical Committee for Human Rights providing uh, services to people who were injured in demonstrations just like the Occupy Seattle street medics are today. Uh, Uh, Quentin, during the turbulent 70s, was the chair of uh, chief of medicine at Cook County Hospital, an uh, inner city uh, famous hospital in Chicago, and uh, fought for the health rights of the, uh, that community for many, many years. Uh, it's uh, Quentin is no stranger to Seattle. He's been here, I think this is his fourth visit, and I would like to uh, show you something from his very first visit. I think it was in 1982. I don't know if you can see that, but, but this is a poster where Quentin was the keynote speaker at a uh, conference that was put together by the Healthcare Coalition, which was fighting to keep the U.S. Public Health Service Hospital open when President Reagan was trying to close it in 1952. So I would just like to uh, read the title of Quentin's talk then to show you what a fighter he is and what stamina he has now at 88 years of age. The title is uh, Strategy for Saving Public Health Care in the 80s. <laughs> and I actually have uh, some vintage uh, posters here from, from that forum that uh, I haven't checked this out with Quentin, but I'm sure he'd be able to assign uh, one or, you know, some of these for people who make a nice donation to our chapter and our effort. <laughs> I'd also like to say that uh, Quentin is really uh, the godfather or midwife to our chapter here in Seattle. And I'd like to give you a very short history of how it got started. In 2005, Hugh Foy and myself uh, were on a medical delegation to Cuba, and Quentin was on it. And we visited with uh, some health ministry people there in every level of care from the highest to the, uh, I wouldn't say lowest, but the community clinics that uh, take care of every citizen in that country and every resident in that country. And I also should say we visited the Latin American School of Medicine, which is training 4,000 doctors from underdeveloped countries across the world, free of charge. And there's... And there are at least 150 medical students from the United States that are getting that care, and they're going to go back to their communities of the underserved. So while Hugh Foy and I were down there, Quentin uh, challenged Hugh and I, and he said, well, if Seattle is such a great progressive case, uh, place, how come you don't have a chapter of uh, Physicians for a National Health Program? And uh, we mulled that over, and a few months later, along with Erica Goldstein, who's uh, associate uh, dean of uh, academics at University of Washington now, we, in Hughes Kitchen, we decided to uh, form an exploratory committee, and the rest is history. A few months later, we had our first uh, public meeting, such as we have, are having tonight, and this is our seventh one. So come on up, Quentin. Thanks very much for that, that swell introduction. But everybody in the audience knows I just did one thing right. I lived a long time. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to be here. This is uh, one of the really bright spots in American fight for social justice and health. And it's thrilling to just see an auditorium this size filled, hear a congressman give these enlightened remarks, which direction we must go. 
Uh, I'll try and give a little bit of the history and, and where we are today and sit down so you can hear some really interesting speakers. Uh, the, uh, when I was in training, the AMA was the dominant voice in American medicine. It had been founded in 1847 in Chicago, and, uh, and in the 1940s, when I went to college in, in the Army, uh, the AMA was the ultimate decision maker. So much so that in 1950, the AMA executive director wrote to every dean of every one of the medical schools telling them to tell the medical students that if they did not withdraw from the Association of Interns and Medical Students, AIMS, that they, they, these students would not graduate. And the AMA could do it. Uh, their, their authority was unchallengeable. Indeed, the first defeat the AMA had on health policy was 1965, and what happened then? Medicare, Medicare exactly. It was over AMA objection, but Johnson being very, very skilled, wily politician made it happen. Now, they were only partially successful. Medicare covers people over 65, and later people who are totally disabled were added to the list. Now, you can tell without much uh, examination that that's the most needy part of our, of our population, people who are elderly or people totally disabled. And the system, the dominant health system under AMA leadership was reluctantly willing to give those people up. And uh, as a practitioner, uh, both in a public hospital, but also in private practice, I would assert categorically without fear of any contradiction that Medicare is an extremely popular program and makes a huge difference in the life of elderly people. Let me give you one example of what that comes out to. About today in America, there are about 16% in poverty, defined by their income and the cost of living. And I fear that's going up. But if you took their Medicare benefit away, did nothing more but that, that number would rise to 32%. That's how powerful Medicare for all seniors has been. And it's an enormous asset to those of us in the fight for uh, single payer because we don't have to point to Canada or Western Europe or any of the other 19 countries that have adopted successfully and much more cheaper, <laughs> if you please, than we, systems that are popular and, and with better results than we have with our costly system. And indulge me in a few statistics. It is a costly system. In 1950, after World War II, the entire health system in America, of course, the total expenditure of the society was less, was $22 billion, from the first aspirin to the last day in the hospital for that year. Now, we, we look at a system last year that cost 2.7, brace yourself, trillion dollars, 18% of the whole gross domestic product. We can actually say at this audience and anywhere where we're advocating for health reform that the economy and the well-being of the whole nation is at stake in the health care issue. It's not merely, obviously, it is very important from a point of view of humanity, of solidarity, of care for the ill, something that are traditions in, in American medicine and American society. But we took a wrong turn when we enhanced the power of corporations to control the health system. And that 2.7 trillion includes literally tens of millions of dollars in executive salaries, 34% of that money that goes to marketing, a polite word for what they do, marketing their product. And uh, I think it's very important for those of us who are advocates to recognize this is a problem in America. We have other ones of great magnitude, but this is a problem that has the resources in place, the hospitals, the physicians, the, the money, uh, if, and we would not have the ignominy of, of 50 million Americans without any insurance at all, another 50 million with very poor insurance. Uh, the health system does horrible things in terms of the whole society. Specifically, one million, every year, one million Americans go into personal bankruptcy. That's one half of the total, two million each year. That's what the health system has turned into. And, and to many people who have illnesses and, and have to re rely on their limited insurance often or no insurance, this is a real catastrophe. And uh, 
those of us who, who practice medicine know how it's important to people to have access to it and confident that they won't be economically de destroyed by, by a major illness, they are with us. Indeed, we have a popular idea. Over 69% of Americans, when polled, answer yes to the question, do you support a federal government uh, support through taxes of the health system? And, uh, and, and in the word, they define, give a single payer option. 69% of Americans today say yes. This is a change. But the, what more interesting and, and important, you should grasp this fact, doctors now in their majority support single payer. 59% of doctors say yes to that question. Well, on behalf of America's doctors, I thank you for the applause. But what they've learned, and this is really important and to everything we do these days, they've learned there's something more fearsome than government. Doctors are a very conservative group and have the usual taboos about government and government answers to questions. But they found out that, that the uh, corporations are much worse than government. And, uh, well, <laughs> they're a little late. They're a little late in learning that truth, and it's, it's a battle we have to wage because uh, it would be ridiculous for you to leave this meeting without an awareness of the power of the opposition to single payer. It's, it's awesome. Uh, even those of us who try and keep up with it, the dollars involved are, are breathtaking. They have 34% uh, of a $2.7 trillion enterprise, and they're not afraid to spend it. And under recent Supreme Court rulings about corporations, did you know this, are people, and they can spend money, billions, against the modest amounts we're able to raise. So it's, a, it's an unequal fight. And uh, I can't say with absolute confidence how it's going to turn out, but I have a reputation for being optimistic, sometimes inappropriately. <laughs> so. But uh, I rather think we'll win this one. American people take seriously their health care and, and cherish it. And uh, I think, uh, as the Congressman pointed out, there'll be signs of this, this uh, wish, wish for decent health care. And I do agree with him that it will almost certainly be through the states at first. And if I may give you a brief lesson in uh, American political history, that's how most of the important things we have took place. A state would, uh, a progressive state like Washington or Wisconsin, where incidentally they're going to recall that idiot who's governor. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> divert you from the larger point, which is that we, uh, we have a society that's ready for single payer. But being ready is, has different stages, and there's a popular idea, and we've had that. Women's suffrage was a popular idea. The end of slavery was a popular idea, but it didn't happen until it became a movement. And that's a really a, a real entity that we have to conceive. We are in the foothills, in the base of a, becoming a movement, a single-payer effort. Woo! Right on. <laughs> See what I mean? It's proven to the, just in this hall. But seriously, that's a concept we should grasp. You folks are the beginning of a movement, and which has to develop fast. Uh, well, good. Take, the, the, take that, that request or demand from me. I'm glad to give it to you. Well, uh, I just have been asked to touch on a few other things, which I'll try and do before I use up all of my time. But. Uh, it's, it's worth saying that the, we do derive an enormous advantage from the single-payer movement in, that we have, which is Medicare. Now, ma bear in mind, we say improved Medicare. Why? Because while the AMA and its allies couldn't defeat Medicare in 1965, they did some grievous harm. They have co-pays and deductibles, which, which are not economically necessary. And uh, it, it's obviously a, a class thing. If you're poor, that copay and deductible is ominous, and, and maybe you're unwilling to seek health care because you can't afford that. And, uh, and so we have a battle there. To, so we always say we're for Medicare for everyone, but improved Medicare without the copays and deductibles, with a comprehensive preventive program. And uh, we know that this will work. It's amazing, a paradox, that American science is way ahead of American economics. And uh, I needn't tell, I'm certain, anybody in this audience, 
God, they filled the whole upstairs. <laughs> That's terrific. <laughs> well, but, but we, we have to have a situation where people are allowed to express themselves. And I agree with the Congressman completely that several states are going to make it happen first. And let me describe uh, what our view in the PNHP nationally, where the strength is. Uh, the three uh, states that are in action are actually on the eve of, of en enacting a, a single payer in their state, Vermont, where the governor ran and got elected on a single payer program, where both houses of, uh, of their, electoral, of their uh, legislature uh, have passed enabling legislation. I don't want to leave you with the idea they've got a single payer system, they don't. But they're doing all the necessary steps, the ERISA uh, waiver, for example, that you heard of earlier. Another uh, state, state pretty close to you all is, is California. As long as Schwarzenegger was in place and sure to veto it, they pass it regularly, both houses, by significant margin. <laughs> now they have a liberal uh, who has worries, and I don't know this for sure, but in the recent vote, the vote was, uh, did fail. That instead of the 21 senators they needed to keep the bill alive, they had 19. It wasn't that the other two voted against it, they just went to the bathroom. And, <laughs> and that's, uh, in terms of, of enactment, that's as much as voting against it. So the people of California have a task. I've just come from there, and I want to assure you, they, they recognize the task, and they're going to make Governor Brown live up to his reputation that he claims uh, as a, and, and bring to that United State, which has a serious deficit problem, single payer as part of the solution of everything, the health care needs of the people and their deficit. Now the third state you may not have heard of is Hawaii. The present uh, newly elected governor of Ohio is one of the sponsors of House Bill 676, which was the embodiment of single payer. And the legislature for some years has been in favor of it. So that island in the Pacific may well be leading the way and be one of the states that that Congressman told us about that will be stepping stones to a national system. But uh, I do want to emphasize that in, in supporting state uh, efforts, and we do, let me quickly add that in addition to the three I've just described to you, there's at least 20 states, this state for sure, our Illinois, where we have introduced, we have had introduced uh, uh, the single payer legislation, but it's far from the enactment. In the, we have to work hard in all of those states. But the whole concept, and it's the take home message, I think, for this, uh, for this evening, that uh, we're gonna enact it in, se in several states. I, I pray that, that Washington is among them and I can see it happening. You have a very progressive tradition. And yes, Wisconsin, which is about to oust its right wing Republican governor, may well resume st that state's uh, role as a, a, a progressive one. So this is the excitement of the next period. And uh, I, I'm sure everybody in the audience recognizes I can't guarantee that this is gonna be successful. But I think it will be, and I, because we've risen to the challenge over the decades. I'm old enough to have been part of the Civil Rights Movement and the anti-war movements, which finally succeeded. But let's not forget women's suffrage in the early part of the last century. And even slavery, although we had a, a grim war, the American people, finally had their popular will expressed. And uh, that, so it is with the single payer effort. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. You have some really, really good speakers. <laughs> good evening, sisters and brothers. It's a real pleasure to introduce Teresa, who is here not only in her own right because of her expertise and leadership, but also as a representative of the new face of organized labor. Labor over the last years has undergone a lot of changes, particularly in this state, and one of the areas you can see that in is health care. In the past, you can see that there have been folks in the labor movement who said, hey, you know, our members have good health care benefits, and we need to protect the edge that we've got to encourage people to join unions. But that attitude is largely gone in labor now, replaced by what has been the basic philosophy of labor an injury to one is an injury to all. Which does not mean I feel your pain. 
but means that when working people are lacking basic necessities, it is the mission of organized labor to fight on behalf of all working people. And make no mistake, single payer is the position of organized labor. It is the position of the AFL-CIO. It is the position of almost 600 labor organizations in 49 states. It is the position of 39 state federations of labor, including the one here in Washington. It is the position of about 140 central labor councils, including the Martin Luther King Junior County Labor Council, the Pierce County Labor Council Tacoma, and the Northwest Washington Labor Council up in Bellingham. Single payer is labor's position. And that's in part because it's the right thing to do and working people need it, and in part because, let's not forget, single payer is also an economic solution which would create 2.6 million new jobs. If that number sounds familiar, that's the number we lost in 2008 in the last year of the Bush administration. We can have them back tomorrow with single payer. One of the first things that our excellent new leaders and the Washington State Labor Council did when they came into office, besides Jeff Johnson, the president, going on the National Advisory Committee of the Labor Campaign for Single-Payer Health Care, was to hire Teresa Mosqueda. We had asked Jeff to come speak on health care just around the time he took office, and he said, well, you know, I could do it, but I just hired somebody who's a real expert and knows a lot more than I do about it. So why do you have Teresa Mosqueda come and speak instead? And, folks, she lit up the room, as I'm sure she will, tonight. She's here as a representative of the Washington State Labor Council. She's part of the State Labor Council's lobbying team and is here really kind of on loan to us from uh, the chaos and, and whatnot down in Olympia at the state legislature, where she's been spending most of her waking hours for the last some weeks. Uh, she's also the chair of the Healthy Washington Coalition. And although she asked me to stress she is not speaking on behalf of this entity, she is Labor's voice on the Governor's Health Insurance Exchange Board, representing the interesting of working people in this state and trying to ensure that we get the best we can out of PPACA. She has a long history as a, a, a healthcare policy expert, um, but she also has at least as long and strong a history as a strong advocate for social and economic justice. Please welcome Teresa Mosqueda. to be here to share a stage with national experts and to be in a room with all of you to make sure that we are fighting together for health care and economic justice for all. I'm honored to be here with you tonight. Thank you for having me. My name is Teresa Mosqueda. I'm uh, the Legislative and Policy Director for the Washington State Labor Council and proud to be chair of the Healthy Washington Coalition, this state's largest health care advocacy coalition with labor, unions, community groups, and provider associations fighting for health care for all. How many of you guys know about the Healthy Washington Coalition? Yeah. And for those of you who this is the first time you've heard about it, find me afterwards, because I want your voice as part of that coalition year-round fighting for justice, but also in Olympia fighting for health care policies that improve access. So I want to be clear that while I am here tonight and speaking behalf, on behalf of the Labor Council and Healthy Washington, I am proud and I am privileged to be also a member of the Governor's Health Insurance Exchange Board, though I do not speak tonight as a board member, nor do I speak for the board. What I was asked to do tonight is speak on behalf of Labor and the Consumer Coalition um, when it comes to trying to figure out where we're at in this cause to get health care for all at the state level and where we're at with trying to implement the federal affordable care. Care Act. So what have we seen so far? In Washington State, we've seen that we are not immune to what other states and what the nation has experienced. We have seen all too well that there are cuts that are being directed at the working class, at the poor, at women, on people of color, and on immigrants as an excuse and as a way, they think, to get us out of this recession. And it is misguided, and it is immoral, and we are not immune, and we will fight back. <laughs> of anti-labor and anti-worker and anti-people legislation sweep across the nation, we say that this is 
this is immoral because it is coming at the exact same time when people need these services the most. Right when people are losing their jobs or having their hours cut, they are losing their health care as well. And what happens? They no longer have a health care and social safety net to fall into because that social safety net has been riddled with holes after years and years of cuts and this recession. What they do is that they find that they come to a state where there have been forced cuts because of deficits. We've seen that um, painful cuts have been imposed on populations, but these painful cuts have come at a time when corporate America has seen record profits. The very health insurance industry that cried when we passed the Affordable Care Act at the national level, who, who claimed that they would be forced into bankruptcy, saw record profits. Last year, in May, the New York Times reported that the health insurance industry made record profits for the third year in a row, actually. And the first quarter, um, the first quarter earnings that came back in 2011 showed that they beat analyst expectations by an average of 30 percent. So the pockets of the CEOs are lined with our premium dollars. And these companies continue to push forward double-digit premium rate increases. Shareholders on Wall Street have seen their gains and their bonuses increased. All while working families go without care, are denied care, and do not seek care out of fear that they cannot afford it. This is class warfare. When you see the 1% and greedy corporations making record profits while working class remains without jobs, without health care, without the decency of knowing that our tax dollars are going back into our system and into our communities, this is warfare and we won't stand for it. going in to serve us, the people who paid those dollars into the system. Those dollars are being spent on endless corporate welfare and endless warfare. It is not a question of whether there is enough money. It is a question of where people's priorities are. These are our dollars. We want them in our communities. We want them to be spent on jobs and health care and affordable housing and making our communities healthier, not sicker, more stressed and impoverished. What's going on here in Washington State? Because of the recession, because of the cuts, we've seen increases in the number of people who are without health insurance. Over one in seven people in this state does not have health coverage. That's about a million people in this state alone without any health insurance. Are states uninsured when they get kicked off the rolls um, of their, their company if they're lucky enough to have coverage or if they can no longer afford coverage that they were buying out of their own pocket? They can no longer turn to our state's basic health program. Why can't they turn there? Because after years of cuts, that program is nothing but a wait list right now. We have a few people on that program, thank goodness, but there are four times as many people on the wait list for basic health than there are on the program. Let me give you just a little bit of context of what we were headed into for this legislative session. As you heard, um, we are deep in the battle in Olympia right now um, during this legislative session. As we headed into this legislative session, we said, please do not make additional cuts. You have to raise revenue. Instead, we cannot stand for another all-cuts budget. Since the beginning, since the beginning of the recession, we've seen $10.5 billion in cuts already imposed in this state, and $3 billion of those dollars have been direct cuts to health care. Since 2009, we've seen 60,000 low-income working adults who have lost their health coverage. We have seen 40,000 elderly and disabled adults who are now getting less care in their homes where it is more affordable and more appropriate. And we've seen over 180,000 people that have been affected by cuts to critical medical services and devices like eyeglasses and hearing aids. These people have been eliminated from these services. And I want to bring one more cut into the room that I know a lot of you are painfully familiar with. A, but a, a decision, a budget and policy decision was made last year, and it said the Medicaid agency will no longer pay for certain visits 
for Medicaid clients in the emergency rooms. They said that this new policy would go into effect on April 1st, and for about 500 specific diagnoses, the Medicaid agency will no longer pay the doctors and the, and the hospitals for these services. So for example, if you're on Medicaid and you have a, a serious issue that you go in and seek treatment for, maybe it's an infection, maybe a mild burn, maybe a sprain, maybe a severe bruise, if you go in and you meet the criteria on one of these 500 diagnoses after you've been screened, the medical provider is not going to get paid. And implementation of that policy is going to cause fear and confusion in the community and people are not going to get health care. It is immoral and it is unjust and we are working as a coalition with providers and hospitals to say this cannot go forward. On a side note, um, before I get to the policy cuts that are underway this year, um, I think that if people are truly concerned about overutilization in the emergency room, then we, as a society, we ought to think of ways to curb that overutilization. We ought to figure out a way to make sure that people have access to preventative care, that they have access to jobs, they have access to affordable housing, they have access to stress-free and, and pollutant-free communities, and that they are able to seek care when they need it instead of when it becomes an emergency. That's what we ought to do. That will drive down costs. That's the humane thing to do. As we headed into this legislative session, again, we stress the importance of understanding the context of the cuts that have already taken place. Some of the legislative members, you know, they turn over um, every two years. So we wanted to make sure that everybody knew the consequences of the cuts that had already been imposed by All Cuts Budget. And we made sure that they heard the cry, not just from Labor, but from the Healthy Washington Coalition every single time there was an opportunity for a hearing. And last week, and in the week prior to that, we were actually surprised. The House and the Senate put out a budget that did not decimate health care services dramatically like we'd seen in future years. It protected the basic health program. The budgets protected disability lifeline for the most vulnerable population that can't work because they're disabled. It protected maternity support services, interpreter services, and after we cried about public health, eventually came back and protected much of public health. And we started writing in notes saying, thank you for what you did. We need to do more. We need to raise revenue. Avenue, but thank you for what you did. Let's keep working. Let's keep going. This is a good first step. Before the ink was dry on those thank you notes, everything changed last night. Everything's changed. Three right-wing Democrats aligned with the right-wing Republican Party, who is the minority, and they hijacked the floor of the Senate last night. These three Democrats, lined with the minority party in the, in, in the Senate, brought a budget to the floor and forced a vote on a budget that has never had a public hearing, that has never seen the light of day, that hasn't had the opportunity to have public input or debate or discussion, let alone opportunities for us to send letters in, to send calls, to go and testify. They forced a vote within hours of, of showing the opposite party of this budget, and the consequences will be detrimental. This, I will do that. Thank you. This is a coup d'etat. This is a coup, right? And this is a coup that deserves accountability and recognition. We have to hold these people accountable, and their names are Senator Demo the three Democrats that I'll name are Senator Tom of Medina, Senator Casima of Puyallup, and Senator Sheldon of Potlatch. So if you are constituents of these folks, you please call them. If you are not constituents, please call them and tell them that their effect, their consequences of their actions will affect the rest of the state because of the cuts that they impose. So they pulled bills to the floor because they now had the majority, right? This coup brought bills to the floor in their hijacked efforts, and they proposed a budget that decimates health care. It kills funding for the Disability Lifeline Program Medical Services. It cuts $44 million from the K-12 system. It cuts $30 million from higher education. It cuts around $311 million from social services and health care programs. And this is all that I could muster in the few hours that we had a chance to review it. This also cuts critical services at places like Harborview, our state's only level one tra trauma center in this state. This is catastrophic if this budget goes forward. And there is a pattern to these cuts. These cuts come on top. Uh, there, there, are cut, um, there are cuts to the working poor. Excuse me. <laughs> <coughs> 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 
Hopefully I don't have to go to the emergency room. <laughs> there are cuts to the working poor, to women. This continues the attack, the Republican attack, on services for pregnancy services for women. This eliminates or decimates programs for food services for the poor, and it cuts medical services for the disabled. This is not something that we can live with. So the timing of this conference is essential. I really hope that everybody, everybody in here makes a pledge to take action. Can I hear from the applause if you plan to call and make your voice heard? The budget bill, the budget bill that was brought to the floor was just the first of four bills that they brought forward. The other bills attack pensions. They attack funding for jobs for public works. They attack funding for local government. And they did all of these bills within about a 10-hour period. The Senate did not adjourn until this morning at 2 a.m. So this fight is new. This fight is just beginning. And this fight is not over until we get those programs back. So my last call to action would be that I think that these look like Wisconsin-style attacks, and what we need is a Wisconsin-style response, so I hope to see you in Olympia. And what are the implications for uh, this policy-wise? These are programs that are providing health care to people who are just about to receive actual health care as soon as the Affordable Care Act takes effect for the most part in 2014. These are programs for the poorest people who will get coverage through the Medicaid program once that program goes into effect in 2014. So if they call themselves fiscal conservatives, but they're cutting off programs for the people who need health care now, they're, those, they're gonna cause those people to go without health care for two years. They will be sicker, they may die. Those dollars will be put onto our premium dollars because the sicker those individuals are when they find finally get coverage on Medicaid that has consequences not just for our society and not consequences just for, you know, human being, loss of human life, but also they have consequences fiscally. So it's a, it's a, it's a bad decision, it's a bad budget, it doesn't make sense, it's not a fiscally wise decision, and it's morally bankrupt. So what we need to do... When it comes to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, there are great comments that were made earlier. I think that this is step one. This is a stepping stone. And by all means, we should recognize that there is much more work still to be done. But there is well-funded opposition that was working heavily at the federal level that I unfortunately have seen replicated in the last two or three months down here in terms of well-funded opposition to anything we want to do at the state level to implement the Affordable Care Act. I believe that we were right to applaud ourselves for the pieces of the Affordable Care Act that we were able to pass, and I absolutely believe that we are correct in saying that enough was not done. But we must recognize that as we saw the battle go down in D.C. where there was compromise after compromise, that same process is being replicated in Olympia, where the industry individuals, um, the corporations, the lobbyists who do not want to see the Affordable Care Act be implemented anywhere in this country are alive and well down in Olympia, and we need your voice. We need your voice now more than ever to help implement some of those policies. From the outset, you heard, you heard the lobbyists from the industry say that they would be fine with um, going forward and, and having health care reform. You actually heard um, some of the industry lobbyists say that, um, that they would not stand in the way. How many of you remember a press conference that Obama had in 2009, I think it was in March 2009, where he brought in a big table and it was televised and it was a commitment to begin working on health care reform. And the, the AHIP group, American America's health insurance plan said, and I quote, you have our commitment to play, to contribute, to help pass health care reform this year. We heard almost those exact same words from the industry lobbyists all throughout legislative session this year. They came to the table, they said we want to play, and then they did everything they possibly could to defeat the implementation of the Affordable Care Act piece of legislation that we had this year. Everything they possibly could. They testified against it, they walked out of negotiation discussions, they walked out of rooms, um, and they lobbied in a pack. You saw the Association of Washington Businesses along with the health insurance underwriters, along with the brokers, along with Primera and along with Regents, walking together, lobbying as a pack, trying to do everything they could to defeat the law. And there were some concessions made. But at the same time those individuals were walking around as a pack, 
We were walking around as a proud group of individuals who represented consumers saying we have to have some legislation this year. We must begin to work forward towards implementing um, the insurance exchange bill. And many of you may be familiar with the exchanges. The exchange um, is a, a new marketplace, for lack of a better word, that will be providing uh, premium assistance to individuals who are middle income below 400% of the federal poverty level and who are the working poor not eligible for Medicaid above 133% of the federal poverty level. The theory is that you provide premium assistance and tax credits to these individuals so that health coverage can finally be affordable. But a lot of this is left down to the states to implement. And we've seen states like California be brave and say to insurance companies that there are certain regulations that they're not going to continue to play on the outside and the status quo that they need to come in and they need to offer in this new insurance exchange. I would say that the insurance exchanges, in theory, have the opportunity to force companies to compete on quality, access, value, and health outcomes instead of what they do right now, just on price and avoiding the risk. But I would also say that the insurance exchanges have been now a centerpiece of the Health Reform Act simply and in large part due to the amount of concessions that were made at the federal level. Because they took out the public option and some other key pieces that I know a lot of us wanted, this has now become the piece of legislation that's the centerpiece for trying to improve health care. So while it is not the best model, um, it is a model to begin to improve access to care and it has a lot of uh, hope, a lot of opportunity for making sure that people get those tax credits, that they get those dollars in their pocket and that they can finally go get health coverage. But when we tried to implement this little piece of legislation in the state, we saw echoes, we saw repeating attacks on health coverage implementation like we saw in D.C. Many concessions were proposed by the legislative members because of the attacks from the in insurance um, industry. But we were successful in doing a few things. I'm, I'm happy to report that as the industry started to say, we need this, we need that, we need this, we need that, and some concessions were made, they kept coming back to the doors pounding and asking for more. Finally, the naked truth was exposed. Finally, people be able, were be able to see that the, all they cared about was their bottom line and protecting the status quo. They wanted a minimalist approach, something that mirrored a skeleton of the federal law. And we were able to push back in the final hours and get a few things implemented this year. So. I'm happy to report that on Thursday, after some political posturing was played, actually by the same people who were holding up the budget and forced their Republican budgets to come down, we finally actually got a piece of legislation passed the Senate on Thursday, and 4 o'clock today the House passed it. It is on its way to the governor's office. Um, And this is important for people like Jadra, who came down and testified on behalf of the um, a Main Street Alliance um, and the Healthy Washington Coalition. Jadra is um, a mother from Spokane who had her brother and the uncle to her kids die after months of being sick, not being able to get into the doctor, had a doctor's appointment. The next day, he died the evening before his doctor's appointment. The health insurance exchange could help provide um, premium assistance to that individual so they could finally get coverage. It's important for people like McKinney, who owns Plum Bistro here in Seattle, who came down to testify to say, I want to provide health coverage to my employers and my employees because they deserve it. But she cannot find an affordable and comprehensive option on the market right now, and the insurance exchange small group market should be able to help her. It's important for people who are like us, wanting to work towards incremental changes so that we can implement a better system a real system, a true system of reform, and this is one step. So while, while we have a lot more to do, we need your voice. We need your voice to be added to the individuals who are down there. We had a huge group of Healthy Washington activists down there, and we got some major pieces in there. What we saw was that on the Senate side, the public option was included twice. In two pieces of legislation, twice it was added back in and then it finally got cut on the chopping room floor. We saw the, that um, the fight for the basic health option, which provides coverage for people below 200% of the federal poverty level, we fought to keep that in because it really makes health coverage affordable because those individuals, it's questionable whether or not their health care will be affordable. We saw that language stay in, and then it got cut at the end. We're going to have to come back and fight for full implementation in 2013, though some implementation will happen this year. But the two major things I want to leave you with in terms of wins, 
This will, this will allow us to create a quality rating system for, to hold insurers accountable so we can compare apples to apples. How long was the wait time? How much do things really cost? What's the true out-of-pocket cost? And we can build that quality rating system together. And the final significant policy piece is that people can no longer offer catastrophic only coverage on the outside market and that if they offer a crummy low value plan, they also have to accompany it by offering higher quality value plans. This is not the savviest thing to talk about, but those are pretty big policy wins after getting shut down piece after piece by the insurance lobbyists. So I would say that every piece of, of the insurance exchange um, legislation was a hard fought battle and it is not going to get easier. These guys have a lot of money, our premium dollars, and they're going to come back and fight and fight and fight and nothing in the federal law will get implemented if we do this at the state level. So we desperately need your voice. We want you with our wolf pack. We want you to be part of the voice that goes around and actually talks about the people that would benefit from coverage. So I look forward to working with you on three fronts. In closing, I want to see if there's people here who are interested in working on three fronts with me. One is to demand an end to corporate welfare and endless warfare. We must oppose these right-wing budgets and end the corporate politicians' reign on both sides of the aisle. And we must make sure that they do not continue to undermine our safety net and our society through cuts imposed and misguided policies. <laughs> Two. I want to work with you to fight to protect and implement components of the Affordable Care Act because corporate interests are chipping away at the federal statute and chipping away at the intent of the federal law, um, making sure that they are just playing raw politics and they are trying to do everything we can to undermine what's currently there. It is a stepping stone. It is not perfect, but I think it's a, a, a possibility if we keep working on it. And three is to continue to advance single payer as this is true health care reform. So my last words would be, you have inspired me. I want to work with you to make sure that we have a health insurance system where you get health coverage because you are human, because health care is a human right. Thank you for everything you do. I look forward to working with you.